so, I just wondered, how, uh, how many of you got a Shema card last week? It's a little card. If you didn't get one, there's a, there's a few more out on the, the uh, information table. So, how you doing with it, huh? Did you memorize it? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to look at mine real quick. So. All right, so uh, let's try it together. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your strength. That soul was the second one. Sorry, I'm in a different version. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. All right. And then you want to go on and say what Jesus said, you know, and you should love your neighbor as yourself. But that's not this verse. That's in... Matthew, this is, in, uh, this is in Deuteronomy, so we're, we're just in Deuteronomy. So anyway, the Shema, and if you want to get one of these, uh, there's a few more out there. So each week we'll give you a card that you can take that you can work on memorization. Because the, uh, the psalmist says, I have hidden your word in my heart so I might not sing it, sin against you. Throughout the Psalms it talks about bringing God's word deep in, inside of our lives. Okay, and then uh, uh, I want to start out with this verse. Oh, oh, first of all, before I do that, if you're using one of these Bibles, uh, there's a rack of them out there. I don't know if anybody is, but if you are, we, we keyed on the slides, we keyed the page number. Hopefully we got them right. Uh, so if you, if you don't know where all the books of the Bible are, that's okay. You can just look at the page, you know, and uh, it goes from... You know, there's a lot of pages, so anyway. And by the way, the Old Testament, it, I think it starts over at 1 with the New Testament, if I'm not mistaken here. No, it doesn't. It just keeps on going. So in this Bible, there's like, like 800 some odd pages. So this first verse, the Lord is good, it says. This is from Psalm 100, one, one of the songs, psalms that have been put to many different versions of music. The Lord is good, his love is eternal, and his faithfulness lasts forever. That's really kind of summarizes the the books of poetry and and also the books of wisdom. That God is good. And we we did that last week and we'll do it again this week. We have our own version of that. God is good. And all the time. Okay, you're waking up, but not quite awake yet. God is good. All the time. Right. He is. And we need to get that deep in our hearts because we run into so many things in our lives that aren't good, so many things that are out of our control that, that uh, we wonder, why did this happen and why is it this way and what is going on here? And we think, God, you could do something about this. But, you know, we have to remember, first and foremost, God is good. And all the time... The Lord, let's, let's read this together. The Lord is good. His love is eternal and his faithfulness lasts forever. So we're looking today at books of poetry and books of wisdom. Books of poetry, those are the, the Psalms and the Song of Solomon. By the way, the Song of Solomon is also known as the Song of Songs. It has three names. Song of Songs, and it's also known as Canticles. Does anybody know what a canticle is? Huh? It's a song. <laughs> it's not hard. It's just an old word for song. So, so uh, Song of Solomon. I don't know if this one works a little better. Oh, uh, yeah, that one. So uh, Psalms and Song of Solomon, and these, these books of poetry and of music, are, uh, they are expressions. I know you have that up on your screen, but I'll just write it down. They are expressions of our feelings, thoughts, prayers, and experience. These, these are not written primarily from God's perspective. They are written from man's perspective as he responds to God. And then the books of wisdom, Job, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, 
Uh, these books are, are basically wisdom learned through story or stories and through, uh, for lack of a better word, maxims. That, in biblical terms, is not a magazine, okay? So just, just want you to know it doesn't have anything to do with that. These are truisms. They're pithy little sayings uh, that, that apply godly wisdom in, in practical ways in our lives. This body of uh, biblical writing is designed, both the poetry and the wisdom, is designed to help us remember... It's designed to give expression to our deepest thoughts and feelings and to capture our imagination through stories and creative and witty sayings. So so it's it's a very subjective uh, uh, group of of writings. Now, if you don't mind, I'm going to do, we're going to kind of do the, keep on with the classroom type of thing here today. And uh, and if somebody, you know, has a pertinent thought, or uh, if I ask a question, you can talk back to me. It's okay. It's all right. So uh, it's hard to preach uh, five books on one Sabbath in 30 minutes or so. So we're not going to preach. We're just going to tell you about them. And, and the, th- the thing that's really great is that as you start looking a little bit deeper, as you start getting to know these books, the first group of books, the five books that we talked about last week, what were... What are they called? What's the name given to those five books? The Pentateuch or the Torah. The five books of Moses, they're called. So as you get to know these books, you begin to realize they're not all the same, just like people. They come from different perspectives. They come meeting different needs throughout the history of God's people and throughout the situations of all human experience. And when it comes to the wisdom and and poetry of the Bible, uh, uh, the same is even more true. Because many times, for instance, in the Psalms, uh, we know very little about the circumstances of, of these Psalms. Sometimes there's a little clue at the beginning of the Psalm. Sometimes somebody is, has deduced, uh, some scholars deduced a, a background story. But a lot of times it's just an expression of what's going on deep inside of the person writing. And you know what? We're still reading them. You know, two, three, four, five thousand years later. So they must say something to every single age. I love it. And so as I've been, as I've been going over this, I've, I've remembered how awesome Psalms uh, or the wisdom and poetry of the Bible is. And you'll find that throughout the Bible, you're going to find poetry. In almost every book, there's poetry or, or musical uh, or lyrical type of writing. Uh, in, in almost every book, there's wisdom that comes through, but these, this set of writings are particularly focused in that direction. So I just want to talk a little bit about the forms that pop up. And I am by no means a scholar in terms of Hebrew literature. <laughs> so what I have learned, what I bring you here, you can learn in a few minutes on the Internet or with a good Bible commentary or dictionary and more, lots more. I mean, there's just thousands, there's probably millions of pages written on the wisdom literature and the poetry of the Bible. So I want to talk about, uh, particularly with the Psalms, but this this also applies to uh, the wisdom literature, rhyme. Now when we we, uh, think of poetry in our culture, we think of rhyme, right? And I, I don't know why I thought of this this morning. I thought of Robert Frost, you know, whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village though he will not mind me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. I didn't really recite that very well, but you get the idea. You know, even Robert Frost, who's considered one of the greatest American poets, he had a way of crafting words, this this lyrical quality. I think it all started with the Irish. (laughs) They, they, uh, they're, they're just masters at language manipulation. And if you go to Ireland and you spend any time talking to Irish people, particularly after they've been in one of the public houses. Those are also known as as pubs. But uh, uh, after they've been there for a while, you'll find that they they can tell you something. They can say something about anything. It could be about politics, history, poetry, music, whatever. And they can go on and on, and you're just sitting there uh, entranced. But when they get to the end of it, you really don't know what they said. It's amazing. Not always true, but... 
But they have a way of putting words together, and, and the, the Bible is no different. But when we think of rhyme, we think of, of sound, right? The words at the end of a line sound alike, and sometimes it's each line rhymes with the previous one. Sometimes it's every other line. Sometimes it starts out with a word, and two other lines come in, or three other lines come in, like in a, a limerick, you know. There's, it's a, I think it's a five-liner. There's all sorts of ways that we do it, but primarily we think of sound. And so when we read the Psalms, we don't always get the poetry of it because the Psalms are not, are not written according to the sound of the words. They're written according to the thoughts that are expressed. And the rhyme that comes in the Psalms and in all uh, Hebrew poetry is about rhyming the thoughts, the ideas. Let's go back to that first verse, Psalm 105. It's a perfect example. The Lord is good, his love is eternal. That's a line. You could actually make a case for it being two lines, but we'll just say it's one line. The Lord is good, his love is eternal. And then the second line would be, and his faithfulness lasts forever. So you see how the two complement each other? You could say it's a, what's known as a, uh, um, an e- uh, how could I say, a similar parallelism. That's the other word I wanted to bring up. That is, one line parallels another. That both of the lines are equal, and it's just a different way of stating it. Or you could say that this parallelism is is one that the first line makes a statement, and the second line helps define it, so it kind of adds to it. So you uh, you have all kinds of different parallelisms in Hebrew literature. You have uh, the kind where each line is the same, or you have, you have a, a kind of parallelism, parallelism where you state uh, one line, the Lord is good. Now, this is, this is a, a psalm from the book of Terry, but the Lord is good, but the evil one will be destroyed. Okay. So, so it like gives you a thought. I'll put the number one here so I don't have to spell it out. And those of you that are teachers out there, you know that I wouldn't really make a good classroom teacher because I, I don't, you know, it doesn't look all that good on the board. But the Lord is good. That's one thought. But the evil one will be destroyed. That's an antithetical thought. Uh, uh, phrase or, or uh, line. Then there's a th- synthetic kind of parallel- parallelism which uh, the second line helps develop the thought of the first. And then, then there are psalms that use metaphors or, or uh, similes, you know, where it says such and such and then it's like this. It's like this. When it comes to rhyming sound, actually there is rhyming sound in Hebrew poetry, but we just don't hear it. One of the ways that Hebrew poetry rhymes is through acrostics. You know what an acrostic is, right? Uh, An acrostic is like... Whoops, I can't do that. I keep wanting to go across. North Hills. So... You could say new, outrageous, religion. Oh boy, I'm going to get in trouble for this. I don't even know what I'm doing here. To have. (laughs) Anyway, get the idea? An acrostic is where the first letter of each word or of each line or of each section makes up uh, some, some logical progression. And uh, uh, one of the best examples of that is Psalm 119, where the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet are the beginning letter of each passage. We don't really see it in, in English, but it's there. It's designed to, to reiterate in a logical progression or in a, in, a, in a flow all that you could say about God's law, you know. So it's the whole alphabet, but it's the longest chapter in the Bible, more than the alphabet. And then there are things like alliteration, uh, 
where you could say something like Christianity is about Christ crucified between two criminals. That's alliteration, you know. It gets annoying after a while, but a lot of modern poetry, particularly rap type of poetry or rant type of poetry, has a great deal of alliteration in it. Uh, assonance where the words are internal, internally the words rhyme, and then uh, this word onomatopoeia, where the word that you use sounds like what it came from. If I say quack, what do you think of? And does a duck, when it makes a noise, does it sound like a quack? Quack, quack, quack. Yeah, it does. So in, in Hebrew, that's actually very present throughout the poetry. Again, we don't see it because of the, it's lost in translation. Uh, then when it comes to the wisdom sayings, I'm not even going to pretend to explain all of these. There's all kinds of different forms. When you read the Proverbs, the, these things, once in a while you see them, but they're, they're parables, and a parable is like a story with a point. There are precepts, which is, this is the way something is. There are riddles, where the, uh, where the writer asks a question, you're supposed to figure out the answer. Rhetorical questions, where everybody knows the answer, but it's asked anyway. Fables, where they take something that's just kind of absurd, but tell a little story to make a point. And, and by the way, there's lots of satire in the Bible. If you look carefully, you'll see it. In fact, you don't always have to look that carefully. It might jump out of you. In fact, Jesus often used satire. Uh, when he spoke, and we, if, if, you, if you do surface reading, you'll miss it, but it, it, it adds to the richness of the scriptures. It makes it interesting, but it also gives us insight into what it's trying to say. So now, I want to just go briefly through each of these five books and talk a little bit about them, about what they contain and about what they are. That's the, uh, that's the technical side, which I just completely slaughtered, but that's okay. Like I said, there's lots of books and online uh, resources. The first one is Job, and the reason I use Job first is because it's, it comes first. It's actually considered to be the oldest writing of Scripture. Genesis is not necessarily the oldest one, meaning it was the first written, but Job uh, uh, was written first. And Job is a story of suffering, of questions, of faith, and of answers. There's a lot you could say about Job, but essentially, it's, it, it, it raises this question right here. Why? Has anybody here ever said, why me? Why is this happening to me? Why me, Lord? Well, in Job, you hear a lot of that. Uh, but actually, a lot of the why is Job's friends saying, why, why would you be such a bad person that God would have to put this onto you? And, and the answer to that question isn't what you would expect. Because so many of us think that when, when we do bad things or live in a way that's against God, uh, bad things are going to happen to us immediately. And so the condition of our lives and all the circumstances of our lives are the direct result of our sin. In Jesus' day, there was a man born blind sitting by the side of the road, and his disciples said, who was it that had the sin here? Was it this man or was it his parents? Because somebody had to sin for this guy to be blind, you know. And uh, in, in Job, it deals with this. It deals with this. Um, somebody, some guy back in the 17th century suggested that Moses was the author, and that theory persists to this day in many circles, but actually most modern scholars say no. He, he couldn't have been because it isn't, it isn't even close to the style that Moses wrote in that we have in, in the first five books. But this is a story of a wealthy uh, Semitic sheik who through no fault or sin of his own, he suffers the loss of his wealth, his children, and his dignity. And it's actually, you could, you could take it as a three-part drama. The first part is, is something we rarely get into, and that is what's going on between God and the devil up there, out there somewhere. It's really one of, the, one of the most interesting parts of Scripture because you got Satan coming into the council and God talking to Satan and Satan talking back to God. I mean, it's bizarre, really. But it's an insight, you know. So and then the second, the second part of the book is the, the longest act. I mean, you'd have to, if, if you were in a play that, that actually 
said all of this stuff that's in the second part, there'd probably have to be three intermissions or at least two potty breaks in it, you know. Because it's long, and, and Job's friends come around him in the, in the height of his suffering or in the depth of his suffering, and they start saying, why did you do this? And what is wrong with you? Why don't you repent? And, and they, they are not sympathetic. <laughs> and it just goes on and on, and Job answers them back, and they talk to Job. And then the last part, his friends have to be quiet because God shows up. So the last part is God and Job. I actually considered today doing an impromptu skit, calling out some of our people that are well-versed in drama, sending them in the back room for five minutes and telling them they had to put on a reading based on this, but I decided not to. So My wife was a little worried when I told her that I woke up with that idea this morning, so because she was going to be one of the people. And then I saw Brian was on the computer. I go, oh, I can't do that to Brian. Yeah, but but it, it, it's, it's just it's riveting when you read it. If you just take the time to read it, read it in a version you can understand. And, and in, the, in the middle of this second section is this statement by Job, which really characterizes how he's feeling in all of this. Not, not so much what's really happening Not so much what is true or not true, but just how he's feeling. And this is what it says in Job 13.50. And this is uh, page 356 in your, your paperback Bible. Though he slay me, yet will I hope in him. I will surely defend my ways to his face. Job is saying, you know, whatever comes, I know, I know that God is there. And I know that I've walked with him. But if he kills me, I'm going to trust him all the way to the end. And I'll, I'll, at some point, I'll, I'll tell God, God, you know my life. You can see everything. You can see everything. But uh, that characterizes what Job is going through. And I'm not going to tell you anymore. You'll just have to read and find out what happens. The second book I want to talk to you about is Psalms. Psalms are songs and prayers of hope, need, despair, victory, thanks. There's all kinds. Whatever human emotion you can, can name, it's in the Psalms. Somebody said Psalms are, the, are songs in the key of life. I like that. Songs in the key of life. Uh, I think it was last year or maybe the year before we did a whole sermon series on uh, uh, so, the songs of the Bible, the Psalms of the Bible. I think it was called Songs to Live By. And I want to just read you a little bit of what somebody wrote about the Psalms. And, and, and try to stay with me because I know when teachers read, it's just the opportune time for people to go to sleep. So what I want you to do right now, just stand up. Everybody stand up. Come on. I'm not going to make you do anything. You don't have to scratch your neighbor's back or anything. Just stand up. Kind of like, do that. Now you can sit down. Okay, there you go. So here, just listen, listen to this. The Psalms are poetry, and the Psalms are prayer. If either is forgotten, the Psalms will not only be misunderstood, but they will be misused. Poetry is language used with intensity. Poets use words to drag us into the depths of reality itself, not by reporting on how life is, but by pushing or pulling us into the middle of it. Poetry gets at the heart of existence. Far from being cosmetic language, it is intestinal. It's from the gut, right? I mean, a good poem is going to stir you up one way or another. The Psalms are almost entirely this kind of language. Knowing this, we will not be looking primarily for ideas about God in the Psalms, or for direction in moral conduct, we will expect to find what it means to be human beings before God. Do you get that? The Psalms aren't primarily a, a systematic theology of, of all the things we need to know about God and His plan and His purpose and all that. Those things come into being. But the Psalms are about understanding what it means to be human before an eternal, immortal everlasting, all-powerful God. Prayer 
which is what the Psalms are also, is language used in relation to God. It gives utterance to what we sense or want or respond to before God. God speaks to us, and the way we answer God is our prayers. The way we answer God is our prayers. Uh, all kinds of ways that happens. We can't always say the words. Sometimes it's, it's silence, the way we respond to God. Sometimes it's with sighs or with groaning, and the Apostle Paul refers to this in Romans 8, and how the Holy Spirit takes what we're feeling as we respond to God and interprets it to God. But God is always involved. It doesn't matter if it's darkness or light for us. It doesn't matter if we're, we're responding in faith or despair. See, we're used to talking about God. So much of our church experience and our, our religious experience is talking about God. We learn about God. We learn about His words. We learn about His ways. But the Psalms, the prayers of the Psalms, are not about God. They are with God. They don't teach us about God, but they train us how to respond to Him. We really don't learn, as this writer says, we really don't learn the Psalms until we actually pray the Psalms. Until we actually pray the Psalms. Now, one thing that I, that I learned here, and I, I missed this in my higher education experience somehow, I don't know how. The five books of Moses, which we studied last week, are actually matched by five books of the Psalms. The, the Psalms have been historically organized into five categories. Uh, God's word to us through the Torah, it's what he gives to us through the Torah, and our response to him is found in the Psalms. So each one of the sections actually matches up in the way that the, that the scribes organized these in, in ancient, the ancient Hebrew scriptures was to be connected with a response. The first book is a response to Genesis. The second book is a response to Exodus and so forth. In the Psalms, or, or when we read God's word, usually we ask a question, uh, what is God saying to me? You know, when we read the Bible, what does this mean? What is God saying here? But the Psalms, in the Psalms, this person writes, the question is, how do I answer the God who speaks to me? How do I answer him? Last night, uh, I went outside for a bit, and you know, the wind's blowing pretty strong, and uh, um, I looked up in the sky. Did anybody see the, the moon, crescent moon? It was just brilliant. I mean, it was just like this sliver. And then underneath of it, I, I'm pretty sure, but, you know, correct me if I'm wrong. I think it was Venus, you know, right there by it. You, they say a planet uh, glows and a star twinkles. So I didn't spend the time to figure out the twinkle or the globe, but it appeared to me that it was Venus. What a beautiful sight. What a, what a sight for me, for a person like me who loves artistic things and, and, and lives in the world of poetry and subjectivity uh, to, to bring me out of this earth and, and up into something greater than myself. And there's a song, it reminded me of this psalm, Psalm 8. And I'm just, it's not on the screen, but I just want to read it to you. And just hear the, hear the rhythm and, and hear the heart of what the psalmist says here. O oh Lord, our Lord, your majestic name fills the earth. Your glory is higher than the heavens. You have taught children and infants to tell of your strength, silencing your enemies and all who oppose you. When I look at the night sky and I see the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you set in place, what are mere mortals that you should think about them? Human beings that you should care for them. Yet you made them only a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You gave them charge of everything you made, putting all things under their authority, the flocks and the herds and all the wild animals, the birds in the sky, the fish in the sea, and everything that swims in the ocean currents. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic your majestic name fills the earth. You hear, you hear the rhythm there? Even in English, it, it, it comes across. I mean, just, I love this song. This is one of the greatest songs written in the Bible. But it's even greater when music is put to it. We, last year we did a, a, a version of it. It's like, oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent your name is. 
How excellent your name in all the earth. Some of you remember it's an old praise song for baby boomers like me. Your glory fills the heavens beyond the farthest star. How excellent your name in all the earth. When you put music with these lyrics, then it, it stays, you know? So I want to show you a, a video right now uh, from Psalm 139. We've shown this a couple of times over the years, but it's just such a beautiful expression demonstrating what the Psalms really can do for us, how they can become a spiritual art form. Not so much systematic theology, but they're there for reflection, for inspiration, for prayer, and for meditation. Now, now one thing that I uh, left uncompleted last week, and I wanted to pretend it was by design, but it was really, it was really the lapse of my aging brain. My wife pointed out to me, remember I said, when you, when you go to the Bible to study it or to read it, there's, there's three words to think of. Oh, sorry. See, I even forgot the order. And I did the O. The O stood for, anybody remember? Oh, man, we got, we got work to do. Observe. You, you observe what's there without try, trying without to read into it. That didn't sound right. You, you try to not read into what's in the Bible, but just see what it is. Look for interesting correlations. Look for the way the... the the passage is structured. Look for what comes before and what comes after, context. And once you observe and you spend some time doing that, the next step is, anybody want to guess? In, here we go, interpretation with my clues on the board. Okay, interpretation. I know it's because your blood sugar is low and you're waiting for potluck. So, observe, interpret. When you've seen what's there, then you can start saying, okay, what does it mean? But even when we go to what does it mean, we have to be careful to let it speak for itself first. Don't try to automatically jump to conclusions. Only after we've done these two things. And this is what I left out last time. Are we ready to apply it to our lives? Just like that verse I said where the guy read about Judas going out and hanging himself. He doesn't, you know, if he jumps to apply right away, the poor guy, I mean, that's it for him. And, and when it comes to this word right here, that's what the next writings are all about, the wisdom writings. And we have in wisdom writings Proverbs, Job we already talked about, Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. And the Proverbs are are pithy sayings about how to live and how not to live. Uh, scholars believe they're written mostly by Solomon, but there are some other authors there in, in, uh, in the collection of the Proverbs. This is not a storybook. These are, it's like uh, one of those books you get at graduation, all the things I wanted to say to you as a dad that I never did, you know. <laughs> one of those kind of books. Uh, and it was written over maybe, you know, not Solomon didn't write these, but the different authors, maybe over the course of three or four centuries from the 10th to the 6th centuries B.C. It's about applied truth through generalizations. Uh, it gives one perspective. You know, you read, you read a proverb and it gives one perspective. It isn't trying to define everything about that topic. It just is like, this is one, this is one way to think about it. Oh, okay, never thought about it that way. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's the life coach handbook of the Bible. And Solomon says, in, in, I think it's in the second chapter, he says that these writings are, are, there's a twofold purpose. They're to teach people wisdom and discipline, and they're to help us understand wise sayings, bring understanding into our lives. And just like in poetry, there's a, a variety of forms, which we won't go into, synonymous uh, parallelism, antithetical parallelism, and all of that kind of thing. But in, in Proverbs, there's really only two classes of people depicted. And I think it's pretty consistent. You know, in our society, we have a million classes of people. Everybody, every individual is his own class of person. <laughs> but in Proverbs, it simplifies everything. It's a generalization, okay? 
So uh, there's two classes of people. There are the wise versus the the foolish. The, what'd you say? Somebody said something. The other, the not so wise, the, the other wise. Oh, thank you, Frank. I, you know, leave it to a, a pastor to come up with stuff like that. The wise and the foolish. There are the righteous and all right, now we're going to start a trend, aren't we? And the wicked, right? So they're, they're all kind of, you know, the smart ones and the dumb ones. The, the good ones and the bad ones. Um, there are the believers and the unbelievers. So all of these Proverbs really, they kind of, They kind of do that kind of thing. So, so they're generalizing they, because they, they present it so, um, you know, this is the way it is. It, it causes you to think. It jars your, your mind because we're, we tend to think in shades of gray in our culture. And Proverbs really doesn't think in terms of gray. Uh, neither does Ecclesiastes. It's just black, but we'll get to that in a minute. So uh, if you, you know, one verse that, that uh, comes out of Proverbs, I just picked this at random. Lazy hands make for poverty, but diligent hands bring wealth. What kind of a parallelism is that? Lazy hands make for poverty, and what's the word there in between? But, yes, that's a clue that this is an antithetical or it's an opposite kind of thing. It's a teaching that you state a truth and then you state the opposite. So that shows you the contrast. Uh, another another uh, uh, proverb would be, Wrongdoers easily listen, eagerly listen to gossip and liars pay close attention to slander. <laughs> you know, wrongdoers listen to gossip and liars pay close attention to slander. That's, that's quite a statement, isn't it? That's a synonymous parallelism. That's you know, the technical term. They both are the same thing, just kind of, Showing it in a little different light. It's better to live alone. Better to live alone in the desert than with a crabby, complaining wife. Oh, they're funny too, huh? In our day and age, we're free to say, because we no longer live under a patriarchal system, it's better to live in a desert than with a crabby, complaining husband. That's okay to say. I mean, that's true too. Yeah. There was one amen there. No, there's no more amens about that one? Come on. Of all the things this book is designed to help us learn and get, to get better at doing, this verse that I'm going to read now, and it's one that mo- most of you have heard or you may have learned it, summarizes the most important. This is what Proverbs takes us to. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Uh, I know the food smells, but I'm going to just take the time to. I learned this uh, when I was 19, I think. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him. And he shall direct your path. See how music helps to... It's in my brain. If you were to ask me what, what Proverbs 18.4 says, I couldn't tell you. But I can tell you what that would... Proverbs you know, 4, 5, and 6. So anyway. If you want to learn, this, learn the Psalms and learn these different things, sometimes music can be one of the best tools to do it. That's what the book of Proverbs is about. And then Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes, what a book. You know, uh, it was maybe two years ago we went, through, we went through a whole series on Ecclesiastes. It's one of the darkest times in North Hills history. <laughs> so what is the meaning of life? That's what the book is all about. And his conclusion, he states right at the beginning, there is no meaning. It's all meaningless. It's all vanity, you know. Is that all there is? Uh, we were sitting in a small group a couple weeks ago, and somebody brought up the this old song, 
I can't remember, was it Peggy Lee who did it? And, and, it, and it's really a talking song, you know, and, and the title of it is That All There Is. And it's just the most depressing, uh, you know, dark song you can imagine. It says, you know, when I was a kid, I went to the circus and I saw the clowns and this and that happened. But then I asked at the end to my dad, is that all there is? You know, and then she, then she goes on and says, so let's keep dancing. Let's bring on the booze. So you can see how it gets depressing. Well, this is, the, this is the, is that all there is, song of the Bible. That's the question that could and does introduce Ecclesiastes. Another question that could actually set the tone for this book is, what is it like to be the richest, most powerful, and most famous person who ever lived? <laughs> because that's who Solomon was. What is that like? Well, Ecclesiastes tells what it's like. This uh, definitely is life at the speed of real so much reality comes through here that it's just, it feels so harsh at times and, and so negative. If one thing characterizes Ecclesiastes, other than the recurring cynicism, it's that human beings are created with this God-shaped hole in their lives, a spiritual vacuum that nothing but God can fill. And even though human beings have been trying for thousands of years, for millennia, they keep coming up against the same conclusions as Solomon did. And this is what his conclusions were, found in Ecclesiastes 2.17. So life came to mean nothing to me because everything in it had brought me nothing but trouble. It had all been useless. I had been chasing the wind. I had a friend who once told me his favorite book in the Bible was Ecclesiastes. I said, well, I could have guessed that, you know, because that's kind of where he was at in his life. This book is not about finding happiness in your circumstances. In fact, the Bible's not about finding happiness in your circumstances. No offense to Joel Osteen, if you know who he is. It's about facing the truth about God and ourselves and finding ultimate and lasting fulfillment in God. Well, Solomon did. He did find that. And he finally concluded this in uh, chapter 12, verse 13. Here's my final conclusion. Fear God and obey his commands, for this is the duty of every person. Quite a story, huh? Well, then I saved the best for last. <laughs> I love this. So we had, we had Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. What's missing? What's missing? Oh, Song of Solomon. Yes. Song of songs. Canticles. Yes. So I'm going to give you a little quiz here. Which of the following? This Oh, first of all, this is a story or a song about the beauty and power of love. So we just tell you what it's about in case you haven't read it. So which of the following defines Song of Songs? It's multiple choice. First, lo it's a love story about two people passionate for each other. That's A. Uh, it's an allegory about the love of God for his people and the love of Jesus for his church. That's B. It's a celebration of romance and sex. That's C. D is this, the one book that makes little boys snicker when they read it. And E, all of the above. Well, it's all of the above, isn't it? It's all of the above. This book is love poetry. It's love poetry. Uh, it, I, I think it, it was like a musical. And, it, and if they actually, if somebody actually made a musical of it, I would pay money to go see that. Listen to this passage. Just, just listen to it. I mean, I wish I could. I wish we all understood all the nuances of Hebrew and inflections and all that, but we have to deal with English here. But listen to it in English. You, this is, this is uh, the lover speaking to his lovely woman. Woman, I don't know at what point, if, she, if they're married yet. It says my bride, so maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But she's, he says, you are like a private garden. Wow, just that right there. You are like a private garden, my treasure, my bride. You are like a spring that no one else can drink from, a fountain of my own. And then she answers in chapter 5, verse 1, Oh, lover, I, you know, imagine your, your love, your wife, your, your special person whispering these words to you. Oh, lover and beloved, eat and drink. Drink deeply of this love. 
That's some hot poetry, isn't it? That's in the Bible. Come on. That's awesome. See, it's this kind of passion which we experience at different times in our lives. Sometimes, you know, after the passion glows, then the, the weariness grows and, you know, it's not quite as hot. So that's why all you couples need to read Song of Solomon together. Come on. Get the passion back. It, it's not something to be ashamed of or to suppress. It's real. It's powerful. Yes, it can get out of control, but it's what makes us alive. Do you know that, that uh, uh, I think it was James that says, you know, Elijah, he was a man just like we are here. We, we think of him as this great prophet who stands on the mountain and calls down fire from heaven, you know, to, to show who the real God is. But, but the, the apostle says he was just like we are. He, he had passions and he had fears. And I'm so glad this book is in the Bible because it reminds me that God created passion. He created love. He created sex. And yes, I said that in church. Well, I'll finish here. And then we have to learn a verse, okay? I, I remember reading this years ago, and it just grabbed me. Because I, I was thinking, yes, about the relationship with my wife, but I, but I also thought about God's love for you and me. How strong, how deep, how powerful it really is. And this is what it says in Song of Songs, chapter 8, verses 6 and 7. Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm. For love is strong as death, and jealousy as cruel as the grave. Its flames are flames of fire, a most vehement flame. Many waters cannot quench love, nor can floods drown. Have you ever had one of those birthday candles where you keep trying to blow it out and it keep, keeps coming back? That's how love is. That's what Song of Solomon says. You can't put it out. If a man would give for love all the wealth of his house, it would be utterly despised. That's what love is about. That's the intensity, a little bit of the intensity that God has in his love for us. And, and what he longs to see, a little bit of that come back to him. And, and he says, husbands and wives Lovers, people who, who find their lives bonded together. And it isn't just about romantic love. It's about friendship. It's about connection. It's about family. He says, don't you realize how strong love is? You just want to walk away. You just want to like pretend like you never knew that person or you never were a part of that group of people, that it just doesn't really mean anything. He says, I died for you. That's what God says to us. That's how strong my love was. Okay, memory verse time. Now, this week I have, I have, uh, the card I have for you has naked ladies on it. It does. They're flowers. And did you know that, it's tr I'm, I'm serious, I, you know, I did say that in church, but it's true. Right out here along the walkway, we have, uh, uh, we have, these bulbs that are planted, and they're called naked ladies. That's the, you know, the common name or the vulgar name, I guess you might say. I don't know what the proper Latin name is. It probably means naked ladies. But, uh, but when, they, when they bloom, it's just the bloom and the stalks are bare. And Diana, as we walked out yesterday, there's all the, this beautiful greenery around them with no blossoms. She says, oh, okay. So that's why they call them naked ladies. So I was taking pictures a couple months ago and I, I just put one on the background here. It's such beautiful blossoms. They're just amazing. But the text way outshines the flower, you know. So I'm going to ask. I, I need some help. I need some young people, some children to come up here and help me out. I have any volunteers? You're going to help me teach the ad adults this verse. Come on. It's okay. Come on up. You, you just stand up here with me. You don't need to worry about microphones because... You're just gonna, your voices are loud enough. Come on up here, Marcos. Anybody else, you're welcome to come. Don't be afraid. All right. So you guys can, you guys can help them. I'm going to say something, and uh, uh, you're going to say it, you're gonna say it after I say it to help them say it, okay? Because they don't really know, and their brains are getting a little old and crusty, so they need, they need unlocking, okay? 
So this is taken from one of my favorite psalms, Psalm 116. It's just such a, an amazing prayer of thanks to God and, and recognition for, for what God has done for the writer in his life, how God actually saved him from destruction. So this is what it says. I love the Lord, I love the Lord because, he has heard because he has heard my voice and supplications. There we go. Because he has inclined, he has inclined his, ear his ear to me, therefore will I call upon him. As long as I live. It's okay if they invert it for the modern version instead of the New King James, right? So it's okay. All right, so now, now I want you to come on, stand up here a little closer because what you've got to do is eyeball these people. Get them engaged, all right? So you guys, that's right, there you go. Get them engaged. So, so I'm going to say the phrase, and, and you all are going to answer me back. Okay, we're going to talk, not just look, okay? All right, so here we go. I love the Lord. I love the Lord. Because he has heard. Because he has heard. My voice and my supplications. My voice and my supplications. Because he has inclined. His ear, to me, His ear to me, therefore will I call upon Him, as long as I live. And Brian deliberately kept the text off of the screen because this is a memory exercise, right, Brian? Mm-hmm. Exactly. All right, let's do it again. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to say it with me. <laughs> I want you to say it with me. You think you can do that? All right, I love, I love the Lord. Wait, 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 let me see. I know, that's terrible when the pastor makes you mess up. (laughs) All right, so here we go. We're going to get it right this time. Here we go. I love you, Lord, because he has heard my voice and my supplication. Because he has inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call upon him as long as I live. Well, now they changed it on the screen there, so it's all right. It's this way. All right, one more time together. All right, this time uh, you can read it because you're going to work on it this week, right? All right, let's say it together. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications. Because he has inclined his ear to me, Therefore, I will call upon him as long as I live. How long are you going to call upon God? How long are you going to call upon God? As long as I live. All right. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. All right. So I want you to uh, thank you, girls. You can go sit there. Next time, where's Marcos? He didn't want to be one, one rose among the thorns. I mean, So pick up a card at the information table, take it with you, and memorize it this week. And Lord, we do need you more and more every single day. Help us, God, to realize that great need that we have, to open up our lives and our hearts to you, to accept your help and your direction, your correction and your great love and grace. Because, God, we don't want to go back to a life of meaningless we want to experience all that you have for us through Jesus Christ even when trouble comes into our life Lord that that through the eyes of faith we know that you are with us we know that you care about us we know that you can and will deliver us if not now you will someday teach us God how much we really do need you we pray in Jesus name